Hello, my name is Jenna Boone, and I'm going to talk about Elliot Carter's Eight Pieces for Four Timpani. I'm going to give a biography on Elliot Carter, a brief history on the Eight Pieces, and then the bulk of this lecture will be me talking about how I believe these Eight Pieces are connected to each other. With that being said, let's start with Elliot Carter's biography. Elliot Carter was born on December 11th, 1908, in Manhattan, New York. Regarded as a major American modernist composer of the 20th century, his musical style is known for its personal rhythmic and harmonic language, including lots of rhythmic layering and metric modulations. His music also has combined elements of European and American modernism to it because he spent most of his childhood and some of his college years in Europe. He died on November 5, 2012 in New York, New York. Living to be almost 104 years old, he was one of the oldest major composers that ever lived. In his lifetime, he wrote 176 works, which include orchestral, chamber, solo, and vocal works. Some of his famous works include cello sonata, his string quartets, and variations for orchestra. Pieces of his that included percussion were triple trio and double trio, which are mixed instrumental chamber pieces. Aside from eight pieces for four timpani, the only other percussion-only piece he wrote was Tintinabulation, which is a chamber piece. He did not become famous for his percussion pieces or parts, but in the percussion world, he's famous for eight pieces for four timpani. Why? First, let's learn about the history of these eight pieces. These pieces were written around the turning point of his musical style. I mentioned that his music was known for its personal rhythmic and harmonic language, including lots of rhythmic layering and metric modulations. However, it wasn't always like that. Before 1950, his music was regarded as being more neo-tonal. These pieces weren't as famous as his later pieces, as he was still trying to find his own musical style. It was around 1950 when he started writing more modern music, and that's when his music started gaining more recognition. He is known for creating metric modulation, which is the changing of both the meter and tempo into another through the use of the previous note value or note groupings. However, Carter needed to practice this metric modulation, and thus the eight pieces were born. Carter himself said that he wrote these pieces as an experiment to prepare for writing his first string quartet with metric modulation. In 1950, Carter wrote six of these pieces, and they were called Six Pieces for Kettle Drums. In 1966, he wrote two more pieces and revised the original six. They then became known as Eight Pieces for Four Timpani. This is what the covers for Six Pieces for Kettle Drums looks like. The one on the left looks like the older one of the two. It appears that he was going through some name changes, not only with the title of the set, but also the title of some of the pieces. The order of the pieces in six pieces for kettle drums is different from what the order for eight pieces for timpani is. The image on the right has Carter's red markings that show him preparing to not only turn these six pieces into eight pieces, but also accommodate the revisions that he made to the original six. In 1950, he wrote six of these pieces, and then 16 years later, he wrote two more and revised the original six. But what exactly did he revise in the original six, and what did he do to the two new pieces? The similarities are the rhythms, length of each piece, dynamics, metric modulations, and polyphonic texture. So basically, the foundations for these pieces stayed the same. He wanted metric modulations, so he wrote them and kept them the same through the revisions. But now let's look at the differences. The differences are what makes these eight pieces so famous in solo timpani repertoire today and what marked the importance of having timpani as a solo instrument. The use of different mallets and beaters and using different parts of the mallets is used in the first piece saeta, the second piece moda perpetuo, the fourth piece recitative, the sixth piece canto, and the eighth piece march. In Carter's defense though, he did utilize the use of different beaters in march, but it did change up a bit in the revision and march was the only piece from the original six to utilize this feature. Another difference is the use of different playing zones. The three different playing zones he uses are rim, indicated with an R, normal, indicated with an N, and center, indicated with a C. The only pieces that this is not used in are the two new pieces, Adagio and Canto, or the third and sixth pieces, and March, the last piece. An interesting extended technique that Carter uses in these pieces is the use of octave harmonics. He utilizes this throughout the third piece, Adagio, and a little bit in the fourth piece, Recitative. Another technique that he uses is sympathetic resonance, but that is only used in adagio. Last but not least is the use of pedaling. I mentioned that 16 years after writing the original six, he wrote two new pieces. But why didn't he just revise the original six and leave it at that? Why did he write two new pieces to go along with the set? What do they contribute to this set? Well, the original six, and in their revised versions, only have four notes used for the entire piece. You tune each drum to the pitch needed and leave the drum that way for the piece. 
In the two new pieces, he utilizes a key feature on timpani, the pedal. Adagio and canto have set notes in the beginning, or in Adagio's case, one note, and from there you have to change the pedal to the rest of the notes. Now let's take a closer look at what these different playing positions and strokes look like and sound like. What makes these pieces so innovative for timpani as a solo instrument is that this piece uses different playing zones and strokes to produce different timbres. When timpani is played in the normal playing position, notes always resonate for a long time after they are played. This is what playing in the normal playing position sounds like. This causes the pitch and volume from those notes to bleed over onto the following notes, creating an overall blurred sound. To fix this, Carter used three different playing zones in his pieces, rim, normal, and center. By playing near the rim, the sounding pitch is quieter and thinner than when played in the normal playing zone. This is what playing near the rim sounds like. By playing in the center, the sounding pitch is fuller than when played by the rim, but does not resonate like it would in the normal playing zone. This is what playing in the center sounds like. In regards to strokes, the default stroke is a normal stroke. This is when you strike the drum and immediately pull the mallet back up, as if pulling the sound out of the drum. A dead stroke is when the head of the mallet is pressed down into the drum after striking to stop all resonance. A dead stroke is indicated with DS, while normal stroke is indicated with NS. So now that you know the history about Elliot Carter and the eight pieces, let's dive into the main topic of this lecture. How are these pieces connected? I came up with this topic after finding out that there wasn't a lot of research on some of these pieces. At the very least, I wanted to talk about all eight of these pieces equally for this lecture, and in order to do that, I needed to find a good amount of information on all eight of them. But after not being able to find a lot of information on some of the pieces, this led me to question why people would not give enough attention to some of the pieces. They were all published together, meaning they must all be important. Carter must have thought that they were all connected to each other, otherwise he could have published them separately. That's when this question came to me. How are all eight of these pieces connected to each other? Out of every source I've read about eight pieces for four timpani, none of them have been able to answer this question. I wanted to find connections between these eight pieces that included examples from all eight of the pieces, thereby giving them the equal attention they deserve as the set known as eight pieces for four timpani. The connections I found include, but are not limited to, the use of a wood-like timbre used in four of the pieces, metric modulations used in five of the pieces, and then I'll wrap up with the overall use of extended techniques used throughout all eight of the pieces. Let's start with the wood-like timbre used in four of the pieces. The first piece that utilizes a wood-like timbre is the first piece, Saeta. This timbre is present on the last page from measure 63 to 75. The first difference that I mentioned between six pieces for kettle drums and eight pieces for four timpani was the use of different mallets and beaters and using different parts of the mallets. While this piece does not use different mallets or beaters, it does use a different part of the mallet, specifically the butt end of the mallet. This section is the first time we see a different part of the mallet being used in the eight pieces. Aside from it being with the butt end of the mallets, making it naturally sound louder, Carter writes it mostly at pianissimo, making it a difficult section to play. This is what this section sounds like. I think this entire section may be foreshadowing Moto Perpetuo, the next piece in the set, although it is unknown if Carter did this on purpose or not. Moto Perpetuo may not be played with the butt end of the mallets, but it is played with a special pair of mallets that give off a wood-like timbre, is mostly at quiet dynamics, and is very fast, much like this section in Saeta. The special pair of mallets that Carter wants for Moto Perpetuo is cloth-covered rattan sticks. According to the performance notes, special rattan sticks with cloth-covered tips produce the best effect. The image on the left is from the performance notes and shows what type of mallets Carter wants for this piece. It is implied that the timpanist needs to make these mallets. The images on the right are the mallets that I made for this piece. 
I used wooden dowels for the shafts, a couple of layers of fabric held together with small elastic hair ties, and then stick tape on the bottom of the shafts. Cloth covered rattan sticks give this piece the wood-like timbre that is present in Saeta, but Carter takes it one step further in this piece. In Moda Perpetuo, you are not only supposed to play on the head of the mallet, which is default when playing timpani, but there are also times in the piece when the timpanist is supposed to lift the mallet up and play with the tip of the mallet. This, plus the three different playing zones, means there are a total of 12 different timbre possibilities in this piece, and they all revolve around this wood-like timbre. In this piece, he uses eight of the 12 different timbre possibilities. It's interesting to note that he used eight timbres when there's eight pieces, although it's unknown whether he did this on purpose or not. Out of the eight pieces, Moda Perpetuo is the only piece that utilizes this many timbres, and Carter did this because originally, there weren't any different playing zones, which made all of the notes in this piece bleed over each other and the notes weren't very discernible. In order to make it not sound like a drone, Carter utilized all of these different timbres. This also meant that the timpanist would have the added challenge of playing all of these different timbres at quiet dynamics. This is what part of Moda Perpetuo sounds like. Canto is the sixth piece in the set and the third one that utilizes a wood-like timbre. This piece is played entirely with snare drum sticks. Something that he writes in this piece is sneak entrances. According to the performance notes, the sneak entrances should be soft enough to be covered up by the ring of the previous loud notes. This is another instance of Carter writing something with a wood-like beater and writing soft dynamics for it. Naturally, wood beaters would produce a loud sound, so when asked to play at a soft dynamic, it is difficult. It is unknown why he did this, but it is known that both he and Jan Williams, to whom this piece is dedicated to, liked the sound of snare drum sticks more than hard felt timpani mallets for this piece. This is what the first three systems of canto sound like. March is the last piece of the set and the last piece that utilizes a wood-like timbre. Much like Saeta, this piece gets its wood-like timbre from using the butt end of the mallets. Although, unlike Saeta, the use of the butt end of the mallet is used for most of the piece. For most of the piece, one hand plays with the head of the mallet and the other hand plays with the butt end of the mallet. This accompanies a lot of polyphonic texture, where each hand plays independently of each other. In the context of these pieces, the polyphonic texture is a melody with an accompaniment. The butt end of the mallet is used for the accompaniment part, while the other hand plays the melody. The accompaniment part sounds like a bass line that would be heard in a typical march, and Carter has the timpanist play with the butt end of the mallet to perhaps mimic a low brass line that would normally play this accompaniment part. To contrast this, he has the timpanist play the melody with the head of the mallet, perhaps to mimic a woodwind section that would normally play the melody in a march. Here is what the first 14 measures of march sound like. In conclusion, the use of a wood-like timbre is used in four of the eight pieces, the first piece Saeta, the second piece Moda Perpetuo, the sixth piece Canto, and the eighth piece March. The timbre in Saeta and March come from using the butt ends of the mallets. In Moda Perpetuo, the timbre comes from the cloth-covered rattan sticks, and the timbre in Canto comes from the snare drum sticks. This wood-like timbre is used to help bring out the character of each piece that it's used in. Whether it's to possibly mimic other instruments or to give more timbral diversity to the piece itself, it plays an important role in connecting connecting these pieces to each other. With that being said, let's move on to the next key feature that connects these pieces together, metric modulations.
Before connecting these pieces through metric modulations, I will explain what metric modulations are. Metric modulations are a change in meter and tempo through the use of the previous note value or group of notes. I have seen definitions of metric modulations as being a change in either meter or tempo through the use of the previous note value or group of notes, but for the purpose of this lecture, metric modulations will encompass the change in both meter and tempo through the use of the previous note value or group of notes. The purpose of a metric modulation is that there is some pivot note value or group of notes that is taking us from the old meter and tempo to the new meter and tempo. If there is no pivot, then it is just a meter and or tempo change. With my overall definition explained, I will now categorize the different types of metric modulations that he uses. I have come up with my own way of identifying these metric modulations and will use these names for this lecture. The first one is a new pulse modulation. This is where a new pulse, which is different from the one that is implied in the previous meter, becomes the new tempo in the new meter. The next modulation is an identical pulse modulation. This is where the pulse stays the same between the previous meter and the new meter, but the note value changes. The third modulation is a tuplet modulation. This is where the meter and tempo change because of a tuplet either in the previous meter or the new meter. This is similar to the identical pulse modulation, however, the identical pulse modulation is done from the implied pulse of the previous meter, whereas a tuplet modulation happens because of a certain tuplet figure. Tuplet modulations feel like they should have been written in a different part of the music, as they feel to have more of an impact on surrounding measures instead of the ones directly involved. As a reminder, these are just subcategories that I have come up with to help better define the metric modulations that Carter uses in these pieces. And again, for the purpose of this lecture, a metric modulation encompasses a change in both meter and tempo. If only one of those things happens, then it's not a metric modulation. Carter does write a lot of meter changes and tempo reminders in these pieces, but since they do not fit the definition of a metric modulation that I will be using for this lecture, I will not regard them. Out of the eight pieces, five of them contain metric modulations, and after carefully analyzing these five pieces, I have determined how many metric modulations are in each piece and what kind is in each piece. The first piece that contains metric modulations is Saeta. It contains five metric modulations, three new pulse, one identical pulse, and one tuplet. The second piece that contains metric modulations is Recitative. It only has one and it is a tuplet modulation. The third piece that contains metric modulations is Improvisation. It has six metric modulations, one new pulse, three tuplet, and two identical pulse. The fourth piece that contains metric modulations is Canaries. It has 12 metric modulations, 4 new pulse, 5 identical pulse, and 3 tuplet. The last piece that contains metric modulations is March. It has 6 metric modulations, 1 new pulse, and 5 tuplet. After reviewing this information, I found that Recitative and March are the only two pieces out of the five that do not contain all three different types of modulations, and they also happen to have the same amount of metric modulations. I also found that Canaries has the most metric modulations, while Recitative has the least amount. I will now provide examples of each of the three different kinds of metric modulations that Carter uses. The first kind of metric modulation I want to go over is the new pulse modulation, found in Saeta, Improvisation, Canaries, and March. I will be using examples from Saeta and Improvisation. This first example is from Saeta. This modulation occurs on the first page of the piece. This is not only the piece's first modulation, but also the first modulation in the set. The new pulse in this modulation is coming out of polyphonic texture. The melody, the legato A and D notes with stems up, are gradually becoming louder and louder, and they're also evenly spaced apart. The legato A and D notes with stems up are a quarter note plus a sixteenth note apart from each other, and that quarter note pulse plus sixteenth note are going to become the new quarter note pulse in the next section. This is what this modulation sounds like. The next example is from Improvisation. This modulation is on the first page of the piece. This one is simpler than the one from Saeta in that there is no polyphonic texture. In this example, the dotted eighth notes become the new quarter note pulse. Here's what this section sounds like. The next modulation is the identical pulse modulation. This modulation is seen in Saeta, Improvisation, and Canaries. I will be using examples from Saeta and Canaries. The first example is from Saeta. 
This modulation occurs on the second page of the piece. I call it an identical pulse modulation because the implied pulse from the previous meter is staying the same through the next meter, but the note value changes. In this example, the implied pulse before the modulation is the quarter note pulse. After the modulation, the pulse stays the same and becomes the implied pulse of the new meter, but the note value changes. We go from putting two eighth notes to a pulse to three eighth notes to a pulse. Here's what this modulation sounds like. The next example is from Canaries. This modulation occurs on the second page. This modulation is actually the opposite of the example from Saeta. In this modulation, we go from putting three eighth notes to a pulse to two eighth notes to a pulse. Here's what this modulation sounds like. The last metric modulation is the tuplet modulation. This modulation is seen in all five of the pieces. I will be using examples from Reshtativ and March. The first example is from Reshtativ. This modulation is on the second page of the piece. In this modulation, the quarter note becomes the dotted eighth plus a sixteenth note. Rhythmically, it's going from 32nd note ninelets in 2-4 to 32nd notes in 1832 time signature. If you just heard these two measures together, it probably wouldn't sound like a metric modulation happened. At best, you'd maybe think an identical pulse modulation happened because all that's changing is the note value, but the pulse is staying the same. However, if we play this entire excerpt, it is more clear that a metric modulation happened because we do not keep playing 32nd notes in groups of 9. Starting at measure 27, we start playing 32nd notes in groups of 7, making the tempo sound faster, and that's because it is. This happened because of the tuplet modulation that happened a couple measures prior. When I was first explaining tuplet modulations earlier, I said that they seem to have more of an impact on surrounding measures, and this is a great example of that. The modulation happened between measures 24 and 25, and it didn't feel like it until measure 27. Here's what this excerpt sounds like. The next example is from March. This example is from the last page of the piece. In this modulation, the half note becomes the double dotted quarter note. Rhythmically, it goes from 16th note 7 lets in 3 2 to 16th notes in 7 16 time signature. This modulation is not much different than the previous one. If you just heard these two measures together, it probably wouldn't sound like a metric modulation happened. But when you play the entire excerpt, it does sound like a modulation happened. In measure 56, we start playing 16th notes in groups of 4 and then 3, reminding us that the tempo is faster. But it just didn't sound like it until this measure. Here's what this modulation sounds like. Carter used many different approaches when writing these pieces, even in the original six. The metric modulations alone are a huge key feature that connect these pieces together and were a new feature in music that Carter is credited with creating. And while the metric modulations alone were impressive, it just didn't seem to be enough for Carter. After working with percussionists such as Jan Williams to revise these pieces, the result is what we see today. Many of the extended techniques used probably didn't exist until these pieces were written, and even still, some of the extended techniques used in these pieces aren't used in timpani repertoire today. Because of that, I felt like I was relearning how to play timpani when I was learning these pieces, in a sense. An example of this is the use of octave harmonics in the third piece, Adagio. According to the performance notes, the way that this is produced is by pressing one or two fingers on the head of the drum halfway between the rim and center and striking near the rim. This feature also shows up a little bit in recitative. Carter said in an interview that calfskin heads are desired for Adagio, but even with a calfskin head, he did admit that some of the harmonics may not be possible. Also, since plastic heads are used more often than calfskin heads, this means that the harmonics are nearly impossible to achieve. It's unknown why he chose to write these if they were so difficult to achieve in the first place, but perhaps he was able to hear it on one set of timpani with calfskin heads and thought that it would be interesting to add to the set. 
This could have been the case for another extended technique he used in this piece called sympathetic resonance, where you play the note on the large staff and move the pedal on the adjacent drum to the notes indicated on the small staff. The result is that you hear both what you played and what you pedaled. In my experience, I've found this technique to be a little more successful than octave harmonics, but Carter does say in the performance notes that if it doesn't work, then the timpanist should hit both drums instead of just the first one. I think that all of the extended techniques used, regardless of whether or not they can be achieved, are all interesting and they are what makes this set so unique and innovative. The connections that I've talked about in this presentation make them even more incredible than if they were standalone pieces. This is a revolutionary set of timpani pieces that paved the way for more interesting timpani pieces to come. If these pieces didn't exist, we probably wouldn't be anywhere where we are now in timpani repertoire. It's because of this set that I've become a better timpanist and overall a better musician, and it's because of the opportunity I was given to do this presentation that I've been able to appreciate the set even more than I already did. My intention with this presentation has not been to talk about everything Elliot Carter did with these pieces and try to figure out his entire thought process when writing them, but rather, my intention has been to present a new perspective on this set. My intention has been to show that this set is not just about one or two pieces, but rather, it's about all eight of them and what they do together as eight pieces before timpani. Thank you so much for watching my lecture presentation on Elliot Carter's Eight Pieces for Four Timpani. I'd like to extend thanks to my current percussion instructor, Chris Froh, and my past percussion instructors, Ben Prima and Dan Kennedy. Because of you three, I was able to learn all eight of these pieces in the first place. An extra thanks to Chris for not only providing the audio for the different playing zones, but for suggesting I do this presentation for my junior recital requirement in the first place, making it so that I could do it, and also for supporting and guiding me through the whole process. I'd also like to thank the CSUS School of Music faculty and administration for being supportive and accommodating to my recital needs and also making it so that I could do this presentation. And of course, thanks to my family, friends, and boyfriend for supporting me on my musical journey and giving me the strength, motivation, and advice that I needed when I needed it most. Without everyone here, I wouldn't have been able to do this, so thank you again and I hope you enjoyed my lecture presentation.